well, this is geometry on planet graph part two. <laughs> so uh, if you're still with us, uh, thank you for staying. I know this is before lunch. Uh, um, there's only two main takeaway points I want to get from this talk, and I will point it out to you so you can forget everything else, but like you have to get the two main takeaway. There will be exams. Right. <laughs> so before we go into the actual talk, I want to thank the wonderful co-authors. Uh, I have Jonathan, my PhD students, uh, Hong, Lazar, Shai, Kyung, uh, in particular, uh, uh, basically motivated the field of the study of planar metrics. So which means that we can speed things up a little bit. No, we're not going to. Uh, if you have questions at any point, please stop me. This is, after all, a workshop. This is not used in their listen to talks and not getting anything out of it. So we're not rushing anywhere. Please stop me. All right. OK, so uh, that's again set the stage. We have the planar graph. And then we have, oh, this is tall. I have to send here. Um, we have the planar graph, and we have some non negative edge weights on the graph. All right? And the key is, like, for the past two days, you've seen many, many results of a similar flavor. That is, there are some certain optimization problems I care about on the graph. And I want to construct another representation of the graph such that the value, the optimal value, is approximately preserved. So think about like flow sparsifier, cut sparsifiers, or data structures that uh, maintains the optimal values of the, of the object, right? So that you can uh, deal with like dynamic updates and things like that. So here we're going to talk about a similar idea. Uh, we want to preserve the distances between pairs of nodes up to a beta distortion. Here, by beta distortion, I mean it's a multiplicative factor. So the distance on the new structure H, which might not be a graph, uh, when you do the query, it is in between 1 or beta times the original distance. Right? So well, like you already talked about this planar embedding conjecture. Uh, the reason why we think this conjecture is so important is that it's really trying to build a bridge between a uh, build this analogy in a formal sense, right? So you have these low dimensional Euclidean space or like space augmented with one norm, and you sort of want to say that, hey, I have a planar graph, I can just put it in a low dimensional space and call it a day, right? So the conjecture is essentially saying that constant approximation is good enough. Well, unfortunately, the best progress we have at the moment is squared of log n by Rao's result. Uh, and in fact, there's lower bound if you want to do into Euclidean space, which is using two norms. So this is wide open. Although there are some exciting uh, progress in recent years, so we might see more activities going on. Well, you can actually take a different approach to this, right? Instead of doing an embedding, we might want to consider this tree cover thing. So let me recall the definition of tree cover. A tree cover is just a collection of trees. So that for every pair of nodes in the original graph, you can find one tree, just one. One tree in the collection that preserves the distance with distortion beta. OK? Um, so this, like for those of you who heard of tree embeddings, the difference between tree embeddings and tree cover is that in a tree embedding, you want the expected distortion to be small, which means that Morally, like speaking, a constant fraction of the tree actually preserves the distance up to beta uh, factor. Here, we only need one. So why is this a good idea? Well, it turns out that in many of the algorithm applications, having one tree is good enough, right? Because if you just store all the trees in some form of data structure, and you just query one by one, and then answer the best uh, out of all the trees, and then you're good. So that's why we want the tree cover. Well, just to emphasize the point that the trees might not be a subgraph or for the original graph or not even be a minor, which gives you a lot of flexibility to construct the trees. Right? Um, you might be wondering like, what's in the background, why, why this page is not having a white background. Well, this is Dartmouth College. Well, uh, in particular, in the fall, we have beautiful four foliage. Well, imagine the upper valley, Dartmouth area, as a planar graph. Uh, in the fall, it's covered by trees. Well, that's not very useful because, well, think about you have a graph. Can someone tell us that how can you easily construct a tree cover 
that preserve all pair distance exactly. Shores path trees, right? So start with every node, compute a shores path tree one by one, and you can cover the whole graph with entries. Exactly. Except that that's not very good because you have too many trees. So imagine, like, instead of having many trees, what if we have some big trees? <laughs> we have a small number, but big trees, so that every pair distance is preserved by one of these few trees. By the way, this is a subtle promotion of Dartmouth College. <laughs> uh, then that would be fantastic, right? So our main result says the following. For every end node undirected, edge-weighted planar graph, you can always find a tree cover with one plus epsilon distortion with poly one over epsilon many trees. So if you stare at it, you might find the result a little bit surprising. Actually, I find it very surprising that there's no end. See? End node, but the bound does not depend on n, which means even if I have 10 billion nodes in my graph, I only need constant many trees. If you set epsilon to be, say, 2, it will be a constant approximation with a very small number of trees. We're not hiding anything in the big O. Like this big O is like a very small constant, maybe 10 or even 5. Um, so we only need a very, very small amount of trees to preserve um, the, 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 the uh, all pair distances. So yes? So I have a question. So here the trees, well, for this multiplicative version, has nothing to do with the original graph. We do a lot of the weird things to pack trees together, and then there are trees that represents the abstract level of hierarchy and that kind of thing. So the tree itself doesn't correspond directly to the graph. Uh, it does, but like you have to open up the box and see what's going on, right? Yes? So for this tree cover, it's guaranteed that at least one of them I will approximate. Yes. The other ones, is it totally arbitrary, or do I still have the non convection You have no guarantee on the other tree whatsoever. Like, uh, you only have one tree. The problem is there's one tree that preserves the distance as well. Uh, so, another question? Okay, so, uh, yeah, the number of trees is amazing, but uh, what's the size of each tree? The size of the tree can be as large as n, because like, you might actually contain every vertices of the graph. Although it's very unlikely, but maybe a constant fraction of the graph is possible. Yes. Yes, very good. Are there lower bounds for general graphs? That is, uh, I imagine for general easy. graph, I think there's a lower bound of the form like log n over epsilon. So I don't think you can do anything better than log n. Number of trees. Number of trees, yes. And I think it's actually indeed achievable. So, yeah. Very nice, yes. I think the concept of this is the tree cover and increase the have the same. Oh, sorry, I cannot find the research problem. For example, yeah. uh, copper speed and acting paper in each other can say divide the pairwise research. By the concept of pairwise research, I just see the G cover here quite similar to that concept. So I just wonder if, if the concept I just see. Uh, I might miss the name of the paper. Let's talk offline. Uh, I, think, I think I missed the, the result, but like if I see what the, uh, what the result you're talking about, I can give more uh, comments. Yes. Uh, so it seems like these trees could be useful for uh, like more general graphs. My question is, when you have a constant number of trees, like what's kind of the densest graph that you can do this thing with? Very good question. Um, we think that minor free graph is doable. During cur uh, based on the current technique, extending beyond minor free, like there's the like, study of the hierarchy of sparse graphs, right? And, Beyond minor grief, we might have some difficulty uh, because of uh, some issue about contractions. Um, so yeah, we, we don't know. Like the, the, the actual answer is we don't know. Yeah. Very good. Like if there's more question, please send it away. Um, right. So let me quickly give you a sketch of how we obtain the result. Right. So our actual technical contribution is this thing that looks like a squid or jellyfish that gives you a kind of partition of planar graph, uh, which we'll talk about later, right? But once you have this partition, you can use it to construct a tree cover with 
additive distortion technique, uh, a guarantee, which means that the error is not of the form of a beta approximation, it is of the form of plus epsilon times the diameter of the graph. Uh, we're going to show how this is done in the last part of the talk, um, but once you do that, there are some standard technique. You basically do a uh, hierarchical clustering and then build the additive distorted tree cover at every level. So there, that's, that's where the log one of epsilon comes from. So you see an epsilon to the minus three times log one of epsilon. That log is, comes from, uh, from additive to modative distortion. Well, once you have the tree cover, let's do an exercise, right? The first application is that you can actually build the so-called distance emulator. So what's a distance emulator? So now think about the piece of planar graph you have, or Dartmouth College, um, and think about a few locations that you care about, which we call terminals, the important nodes. The goal is to only preserve distances between those terminals. So this is like a subset version. This is not pairwise, but it's a subset version of the uh, distance uh, emulator. The goal is again to construct a different graph that might contain other vertices, but it has to contain all the terminals in the original graph so that the distance is preserved up to one plus epsilon factor. Well, uh, how do we do this with tree cover? So imagine you already have the tree cover. Now for each tree, there are at most k terminals on it, right? So you just contract every degree to nodes. Now the new graph, the remaining graph, has size order k. So you only have constantly many trees, so you overlay those trees, contracted trees together. Together it forms a new graph that has size order k over some poly epsilon. And that's it, that's the whole construction. It's very easy, right? Well, um, this already beats the previous best bound uh, by me and uh, uh, Ravi and uh, Zihan here uh, by like a factor of poly log. Well, except to their defense, um, that emulator construction aims for something better, right? So that emulator by itself is planar, which allows you to do some kind of bootstrapping technique. Whereas here, when you overlay the trees, there's no guarantee that you get a planar graph back. So depending on your application, if you don't care about planarity after the emulation, then you can easily get a linear bound in terms of number of terminals. Yes. So uh, now, because you said your tree is not, every node is not necessarily the original node, yes. so the contraction is not that clear to be there. So except that the terminals are guaranteed to be in one of the trees, right? Because for every pair of terminal, there will be a tree that preserve their distance, and in particular, that two terminal has to be in the tree. Right, so then overall, when you overlay everything, all the terminals will be there. Yes, there are other Steiner points or whatever. Okay. Very good. Yes. So here you care about this k choose two distances. Like yes. Among yeah. So like this, so that's why I mentioned it's not exactly the pairwise version that you talk about because there, conceivably, you can imagine something even better, right? Uh, where here, like the bound depends on the number of sub, uh, terminals, and it's like all all pair between terminals. There is a question around there. The reason I keep looking at this area is because like, I'm, like somewhere I saw a question. Yes? Yeah, um, sorry, so I just have a question about the construction you are just describing. So basically, um, because you don't have the non-contraction property for the other trees, like what, what happens if like one of those other trees has like a really short path to the terminal that doesn't exist? In the ah, it won't because we have the lower bound. Like we have the uh, tree cover had the, this like a sandwich property which uh, requires you to have a lower bound. The tree distance is at least the original graph distance. Oh. So, which means that your tree can never shrink the graph distance. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah. Um, but, but, but that only applies to one of the trees. Like, what, like, could you have a different tree which doesn't obey this? Oh, okay, so in fact, we guarantee this for all pair of nodes on every tree. So for the lower bound, for the lower yeah, bound, for the lower bound. For the upper bound, the guarantee is uh, it one tree. Yeah, that's a very good point. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. That's uh, in the definition of tree cover. 
Okay, so there are other applications, right? Uh, you can imagine using the same idea, um, quoting uh, uh, Thetrafold on day one, uh, once you have a tree, you solve everything, right? So now you reduce the problem to really just trees, and then you can solve, for example, data uh, distance oracle on trees directly. So we obtain our first uh, linear space distance oracle on planar grass with a big O of log log and query time in the pointer machine model. So the pointer machine model is way harder than the word rain model, which you have a constant query time, uh, which in fact has been solved by Hume and uh, Christian in 2016. Uh, there they do some of these like uh, word packing, like bit packing tricks into word rain, uh, which sort of abuses the word rain model, uh, whereas here we reduce the problem to uh, LCA on trees, and then using techniques on, uh, for LCAs, we can just solve it directly. Uh, you can solve other things like uh, distance labeling and like hop distance emulator and things like that, right? So, uh, in fact, this is the first takeaway. Um, if you have a favorite problems on planar graph, try to think about if your problem can be solved on tree, and then later on merge it together. So, if you have something re uh, distance related that you want to solve on planar graph, try to solve it on tree. And if it's decomposable in in the way that uh, you can extract answers from the trees you have, then you can apply this theorem and then just solve it. It turns out that the partition we have solves other problems as well. So one of the exciting uh, results, which we just published yesterday on archive, uh, is a resolution to the Steiner point removal problem. So what's Steiner point removal? Um, the same setting, you have piece of planar graph, you have k-terminals. This time you want an emulator with no Steiner points. You have to remove all the Steiner points. And in fact, you also require this new graph to be a minor of the original. So you're trying to contract the whole graph, contract away all the Steiner points until only terminals remain. And Anupam Gupta conjectured that this uh, can be done in the way that you have a constant distortion in the end. So this question has been open for like 20 years. Um, so there are some progress, like first on trees, outer planar graphs, series parallel graphs, and constant path width, right? In fact, Arnold Filter's paper uh, in 2020 gives you a framework saying that if you can construct a partition of the following form, then you can solve Steiner point removal on that class of graphs. So what's scattering partition? Well, it's a partition so that for any delta, this is not necessarily the diameter. In fact, you have to do it for all delta. Um, you can decompose the graph into some small pieces. Each piece is a connected cluster of diameter at most epsilon times delta. In such a way that now if you consider a shortest path between U and V, Every shortest path between U and V passes through H clusters, where H is a small constant. Right? If you can do a partition of this sort, then he come up with some ways to do this recursive clustering scheme to obtain the solution to SPR. Well, unfortunately, we haven't been able to construct scattering partition yet. In fact, this is still open. Uh, like maybe some of you can think about this problem and see if you can construct a scattering partition. Well, we can construct a different partition by changing four things. The first change is that instead of what we call the weak diameter, when you're measuring the diameter, you can look at path that's strictly within the cluster or you allow path outside G, right? In the original definition, it's weak diameter. Here we need strong diameter. Now, the second change is instead of for every path between U, V, we can show that there is one path between U, V. And on top of that, we allow some approximation on that path. So it's not exactly shortest path. It's an approximate shortest path. The final change is now if you look at the shortest path from U to V, you might pass through actually many clusters. And there's no way to get around it. Like our approximate shortest path might still pass many clusters. However, if you look at the graph at the cluster level, by treating every cluster as a node, you can go from C1 to C2 directly to C3, because 
C2 and C3 are adjacent. So there is a bypass, a shortcut from C1 to C2 to C3. And our guarantee is that there is always a path in the cluster graph from CU to CV that goes through only constant many clusters. So uh, it's a mouthful. It's a, <laughs> the technical definition of this partition is not very uh, easy to use. However, we can show that we can, uh, the SR, SPR problem can still be resolved under this uh, more relaxed version of partition. So I won't go into details. If you uh, want to know about the algorithm, it's essentially following Unfiltered's uh, framework uh, and both papers are archived. So uh, if you have questions, come talk, talk to us. Yes? Can you make a strong and weak diameter? Which uh, one's inside? Strong and weak diameter? So for our partition, we need strong diameter. One of the reasons is that later on, we need to cook up a path. I'm just asking yes. strong. What do you mean by strong? Oh, by strong, I mean that uh, the diameter, when measured only for path completely lying inside the cluster, it has to be distance at most uh, epsilon delta. Because there are clusters where you can imagine inside the cluster, all pair distance are kind of far away, but then they can route through outside the cluster with a uh, distance at most epsilon delta. In that case, you say you have weak diameter uh, epsilon delta, but not strong diameter. Yeah. So I guess for like classic scattering partition, there's a log and lower bound. For your relaxation, does this lower bound still hold? For general graph? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Or like um, theoretically, could you try and get a constant for general graphs? Yeah. Is, for general graphs, I think you still, it's skeptical. I think login is still, still what you need. It's something very specific to planet graph. Yes. Uh, let me check the time. Okay. Um, I have five minutes. So uh, I will skip over the embedding to constant true with graph. Uh, the short uh, answer is we can construct directly from additive tree cover. Uh, which allows you to build relatively easily by overlaying all the trees together in a nice way and you get a low tree of graph, right? And that leads to applications in mostly clustering like denominations and like uh, there's a new paper on the idea of scattering dimension that relies on scattering partition. So you can solve problems there. All right, um, for the last five minutes, I will give you a quick sketch of how can you even come up with a shortcut partition. And from there, how do you get a tree cover? Takeaway point number two, planar graphs are grids. Well, in fact, whenever you try to think about what's a planar graph, you think about something like this, right? And which means that if you just partition things roughly into small portions, they sort of look like a grid. Well, okay, so let's see how do we construct a shortcut partition for grids, right? So the nice thing about grids is first you have columns. And not just columns, there's a shortest path from the top node to the bottom node of the column. That's like part of the definition of the grid. So maybe one attempt for us to say a planar graph looks like a grid is to find a collection of destroying shortest path so that they have a shortest path passing through uh, the, the, the column. Well, and there's a second property. That is, for every edge that is not in the column, you have to go between adjacent columns. You cannot jump over, right? You cannot skip. You have to go from column i to column i plus one. Well, a generic planar graph doesn't have these properties, right? The first obstacle is, like, you think about star. There's no way to really construct a second column on the nodes on the right hand side because there's no shortest path. Like you have to route through the center, but then that makes the column non disjoint. So the resolution to that is just okay, fine. Let me define a column for each of the nodes, which means that instead of having a path structure on the column, you have a tree structure. Okay. Um, the second obstacle comes from wheels. So think about these like two layer wheels. So you first compute the column. When you're about to compute the second column, you notice that the edge at the top has to be between column one and column two because the column adjacency property. 
which means that you cannot really squeeze the two purple columns as column two and three. It has to be the right hand side column to be column two. That means that the middle part has to be dealt with separately. So we sort of do a recursion, like downwards. And then once you have recursion, you have to worry about okay, maybe the recursion depth is too deep. We have to do like a constant level recursion, right? Uh, fortunately, these two obstacles are the only obstacles we have. So we can construct for every planar graph a thing called a grid tree. So the way to do it is the following. You construct the first shortest path, uh, first shortest path, and then you open up a neighborhood of roughly uh, epsilon delta radius. Now you look for the first two nodes that have not been covered by that neighborhood and compute a second shortest path and open the neighborhood again. So you repeat, repeatedly doing this. Sometimes when you compute a shortest path, after you open the neighborhood, there are some vertices that are left uncovered, right? That's okay, we call it leftovers and we'll defer to the next level. So you just keep doing this and sometimes you have to split into tree structure, but then you just cut the whole graph into a bunch of columns. Now you recurse, like for every leftover piece, you build another grid tree, right? The crucial property here is that if you look at the outermost epsilon delta radius around the planar graph, um, it has to be covered by one of the columns at the top level, which means the recursion depth of the hierarchy is at most one over epsilon. This is how we control the recursion depth. Right? So you make sure that the column is fat enough so that most of, uh, all the nodes close to the exterior has to be covered by columns. Well, now once you have that, I can quickly sketch how do you do the clustering into the shortcut partition. Right? The way you do it is do a greedy algorithm. You start at the first node, you walk for about epsilon delta, uh, in fact, there's a constant that one has to worry about, and you draw another cluster center, and you just keep walking, keep walking, do something like this. And then you just do a clustering of the column, where every node will be clustered to the closest cluster center. And you do this for all the other columns, and together you have basically the rows of the grid. And that gives you a shortcut partition. Well, of course, I have to prove that this thing is actually a shortcut partition, right? So if you have a shortest path, uh, you can first analyze like portions that are relevant at the current level and say, look at this particular purple. It might go in and out a particular column so many times, which means that there's no constant bound really, right? But this is where this shortest path, the spine of the uh, the, the column uh, comes into play. Because you can always find a detour on that particular shortest path um, so that it doesn't go in and out of the columns too many times. And then on top of that, because of the distance guarantee, this is a shortest path, which means that the blue will be not much longer than the purple. Which means the number of columns and then uh, as a corollary, the number of clusters your path can pass through at the current level must be a constant because like constant many columns and within each column there's constant many clusters you pass through. Well and then you recurse for one over epsilon level. So that's epsilon to the minus three. Um, how do you get tree cover? Once you have the columns you draw a shortest path tree by having these strips of around with uh, delta. Because your shortest path can be length of half ounce delta. Remember delta is the diameter, right? That means if you do a shortest path tree from each of the cluster center, they will represent the distance pretty well, like this. Except that there are a few things you have to worry about for example, there might be more than like a constant many strips, and then on each column there are many, many 
cluster centers, right? But in total, I only allow constant many trees. So you need to do some kind of packing. For example, this top tree and this tree that's far away from me and this tree that's like down there will be distance a delta away from each other, which means that you can safely collect them into a forest and then you build a tree out of them, right? So this way you can control the total number of trees. And that's how you get a tree cover with plus epsilon delta uh, distortion. So in summary, um, we have this uh, new tool set really uh, that allows you to solve many distance problems in planar graph. And uh, here we welcome you to think about your favorite problems uh, on planar graph or in general graph and see if the uh, thing uh, the, the tree cover uh, tool can apply. Um, so we have already, some of you have already uh, talked with us about some potential applications and we welcome more. So thank you. to the four in the tree width bound. Yeah. So for the tree cover, it will be one over epsilon third times log one over epsilon. Yeah, but if you say that log one over epsilon is what is lost between this two. Between yeah. additive, no, between additive two multiplicative. Yeah, so, the, so the, there we will, we will have one over epsilon. Oh, no, no, it's a different problem. That one is embedded into bounded tree width graph, yeah. where here it's the additive tree cover. So it's yeah, not exactly the same problem. I'm sloppy in my slides. Oh. Okay. So, so all the number you do see is accurate up to one for the epsilon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so just to follow up, if you let's say have an embedding of the panel graph into uh, bounded tree width graph, the tree width of this number, and you can embed it to um, a type of tree cover with like the same number of trees. In terms of applications, which do you think is better? It's a different kind of problem, right? So like uh, if you use tree cover, the problem you tend to be able to solve is like distance oracle related type of things. Whereas if you're doing embedding tree width, you want to do DP. So like the problems are uh, like an independent set and clustering type problems works better in that scenario, right? So I think it's you, like they're both useful uh, towards different type of applications, I think. Any other questions? On a scale of one to ten, how how helpful are you about say resolving GNRS using tree covers? <laughs> okay, you you might also want to give a number. Uh, <laughs> to me, two. Okay. okay. Do, do you no, mean like ten is the most likely or ten is most likely? Ten is the most likely. I say zero. Zero. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe I'm already over optimistic. Okay. <laughs> Is there a reason that it's like a foot? Wait, what? Oh, the, the squid? Like a foot. Oh, the foot. Uh, yes, it's a foot. <laughs> oh, I, I, I look at this one, so I think it's a squid. Oh. <laughs> okay, Alex and Shane, and take the other questions, I think.